I'm here at the Royal Free Hospital um, attending Peter Tove Sullivan's clinical workshop for physiotherapists on the chronic low back pain in sporting populations. Peter, welcome to our chat on core stability and the differences with cognitive functional therapy. Thanks, James. In the last couple of years, you've coined the term cognitive functional therapy. Can you explain the differences between core stability and cognitive functional therapy Please. Yeah. Well, uh, the, um, the term core stability, I don't really understand, James. Uh, it's sort of emerged as some idea, you know, the idea we have a core in our back, I don't quite get. If you consider the anatomy and architecture of the spine, there's no real core. We have a spine with a bunch of muscles that operate around it. Uh, and those muscles are involved in control of movement and body posture. Um, they can generate forces to stiffen the spine. But essentially, we've got a three-dimensional movement system where a variety of muscles operate to control the spine and space. So the idea of a core, a central core that we have that fun fundamentally supports the spine doesn't really fit with my understanding of the spine and my understanding of the literature. Um, we would see the spine much more in terms of a three-dimensional movement system uh, that has a whole variety of complex systems around controlling movement and posture that incorporates intra-abdominal pressure um, and, uh, and the whole motor system is geared around controlling that movement in space and in the high load situations co-activation co-activating to stiffen it. So I don't think the term's helpful. What it's tended to lead to is this idea that stiffening your back is better uh, is that more, more bracing of your spine or pre-bracing of your spine is healthy for the back and what we know is in fact when you brace your spine you tend to compress it more and compression is one of the mechanisms that we know potentially can lead to to pain and we've seen this in terms of um, you know in sporting situations with uh, uh, stress fractures for example where uh, excessive compression actually is probably something you don't want and probably this concept around core stability has led to an approach to management where people think you've got to pre-stiffen your back you need more core muscle strength or trunk muscle strength and that's a healthy thing for your body. Now of course you need a certain level of control for your body to a con optimally control your body in space but too much can be detrimental as well. So why and when did you develop your own concept of cognitive functional therapy? Well I suppose what you're considering here is that um, in terms of pain disorders uh, we see a whole variety of people with pain. We see some people who have, you know, say very passive postures and that can be related to abnormal patterns of movement where you want to facilitate the motor system to better support and uh, the, the structures of the spine to optimally load it. And yet we have the other end of the spectrum where we see people who are massively overworking the spinal muscles, uh, bracing their core muscles or pulling their bellies in and contracting their pelvic floors and overworking their back muscles for the fear that they're going to hurt themselves. And, and I don't think that whole approach has helped us at all. It's certainly not helped patients uh, in their ability to function. So moving away from this idea of more is better um, to a much broader system of the role of the mind and the body, which is both a cognitive and functional approach to both evaluating and managing the system is a lot more evidence-based and a lot more logical and probably a lot more helpful for the patients. So for the benefit of our patients and listeners, can you provide three take-home messages for them to resolve not only their back pain, but also for, to fulfil their sporting and functional ambitions? Well, I, I think the issue with back pain is there are so many factors that can be related to back pain. We know that in a small group of cases, and we saw a case yesterday where there was a stress fracture in the back, uh, and that was related to a lack of body awareness and, and the, a tendency to move in a way that was very stressful for the spine. Um, uh, we know in other cases it's lifestyle factors that can have an influence in terms of deficits in sleep or chronic stress, where in other factors we know that the drivers of pain are much more around the cognitive aspects of pain. So there's no one thing uh, that you can tell people in, in terms of what might be arising in terms of their pain. But I think there are some general aspects of advice that are very helpful. Uh, we don't think pre-tensing your body before you move is normal. And there's a general belief out there that if you pre-tense your core when you move, it's better for you and there's very little evidence for that. Um, in fact, we see numerous cases where that in fact is very provocative. 
Um, but that tends to be the common belief, that your back is vulnerable, so you've got to pretense your back before you lift. It's probably very unhelpful. It's certainly not natural. But we know, so we know that movement is healthy. We know that physical activity is very good. We know that sedentary behaviours are unhelpful. We know that thinking positively about the structure of the spine, it's a robust, strong structure that should be trusted. We know that a whole bunch of things that you might see in an MRI scan are not predictive of pain. So we would get people to think much more positively about the back. Um, that they don't have to spend their time attending to the back and strengthen their core and bracing their muscles when they move, that they need to trust their body more and develop normal healthy patterns of movement and lifestyle and that's probably going to have a much longer beneficial impact on their back than spending a lot of time focusing abnormally on muscles that just should be doing their job without us thinking about it on a day-to-day -day basis. And lastly, your approach is challenging a lot of existing beliefs by the health industry. Is, yeah. it, is your approach met with much resistance? Oh, massive. I mean, if you think of the common belief about the back, it is a vulnerable structure that needs to be protected. You know, the discs are these vulnerable structures. Uh, you know, if you bend, you might hurt your back. We teach people to hold their backs in these straight postures and we teach people to pre-tense before they move. Mm. We've got gymnasiums doing core exercises where planks and side planks and back planks or pull your belly in before you move. And I think what it's created is this whole uh, belief around the vulnerability of the spine. Uh, and yet we know if you go and look at third world countries of people hauling their whole livelihood around in their heads and they can do that seemingly freely day to day. We've got people bending over in the fields every day in terms of uh, you know, working paddy fields and they're not thinking about these things that we think of. I, I, I think we've created an enormous amount of fear around the back and this whole stability approach has really reinforced the belief the spine's to be feared. Uh, that you can't trust it, so you've got to consciously pre-tense muscles. We don't do it with any other body part. We don't pre-tense with our knee or ankle, or our wrist or our shoulder. So why we've done it for the back, to me, is probably generated around a sense of this is a vulnerable structure we need to protect. But to change that belief is very, very hard because there's a whole industry that perpetuates the myth. Uh, and if you look at the evidence around significant back pain disorders, uh, the evidence would tell us that, in fact, these, for these people, the, most, the muscle system around the track is actually overworking. There's too much stability in a lot of these problems. And so the idea of giving more, in fact, is perpetuating what's already a fundamental problem for those patients. So it's a very difficult thing to change. And often when we talk about this, um, people get quite defensive because it, it challenges our own belief system about the body. I think the other thing is there's been a lot of extrapolation from a little bit of data um, uh, that suggested that some of these, uh, some back pain disorders are linked to deficits in, say, muscles like the transverse abdominis or the multifidus. But the more contemporary evidence around back pain is really challenging that belief, where in fact there are studies now looking at chronic low back pain showing that muscles like multifidus uh, and uh, the transverse abdominal wall are actually, in some cases, many cases, overactive uh, and can't relax. So the idea of giving more to that group doesn't make sense. And I think the other thing that has emerged is now we've seen so many randomised controlled trials that have tested the belief that more is better or stabilisation training is better. And it's not shown to be any different than general exercise or manual therapy. And the effect sizes are very small, so only small changes in pain and only moderate changes in, in disability. And we've been involved in a, a randomised controlled trial that compared manual therapy to stabilisation and, and stabilisation exercises to a more cognitive functional approach of empowering people to trust their body, normalise movement, develop positive beliefs around their back uh, and return to function. And the effects were significantly superior. So at every level, I think it's probably not helpful. And I, I think the sooner we move away from that, uh, the better for, the, for ourselves and as a population as well. So Peter, I think your work and your research is revolutionising the approach of physiotherapy and I wish you every success in, in converting people and getting on board these doctors and physios who have these sticky beliefs and they change quickly. Yeah, and I think the thing with that too, James, it's not just my work. There are a number of researchers around the world who are realising, as I have, because I once held some of these belief systems, yes. 
um, and I advocated them. Uh, but it was the data, when we started looking at the data and the research we're doing, we realised the system wasn't doing what we thought it was. And we realised that what was driving our practice was more, more of a belief than the reality of what we were seeing in, in, in the research lab. So there are a number of research groups who have been talking about these things for a long time, uh, but the, their voices haven't been really heard. And I think it highlights how powerful our beliefs are in driving practice and how reluctant we often are to adopting the evidence when it challenges our beliefs. And I think as a profession and as a society, the, 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 the sooner we can shift our view on, on the back is a fundamentally strong and robust structure that we can trust and as long as we move well and, and, and are physically active, engage in our life and think positively about it, we're probably better off. Well, I wish you and your co-workers every success in transforming the treatment of low back pain in, in, the, in the world. Thank you.